Firstly, let me say it's, it's great to be back in Singapore. I, I did spend some time uh, living here in the 80s, which probably betrays my earlier statement, but uh, it, it is a great place to, to work and live. And um, I therefore know that Singapore has long relied upon innovation and forward thinking to overcome many of the challenges that it's faced during its long history. And today, however, I would say it really faces a challenge which is perhaps one of its toughest challenges in its history because it has to understand how to continue its economic progress in which it's been so successful but whilst fulfilling its commitment to the Paris Agreement on climate change. And in respect, it is also true of many countries here in Asia that face that same challenge. The International Energy Agency predicts that most of the growth for energy demand will come from developing countries outside of the OECD. That's the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And just to put some numbers around that, from 2012 to 2040, the total energy use in OECD countries is expected to rise by about 18%. Now, you might think that in its own right is significant, but in comparison, the energy demand outside of the OECD in that same period is expected to rise by a staggering 71%. So in short, Asia will need much more energy, but also has the challenge of producing less CO2. And of course, every country in the world and every country in Asia is in a different stage of transition when it comes to managing this energy transition itself. Each country, too, is coming up with its own solutions to that challenge. And let me give you three examples from three different countries. And let's start with Japan. And Japan derives most of its energy from natural gas. Of course, it has cut back significantly on nuclear power after the Fukushima incident. And in transport, the country is exploring hydrogen as an alternative fuel. And last year, the government more than doubled its funding for hydrogen cars and, most importantly, hydrogen infrastructure. Let's move to our second country, India. And India aims to get 40% of its energy from alternative sources by the year 2040. And these sources include wind, solar, hydro, biogas, but India is also including nuclear. But gas will play a very important role as well in transport. And in transport, biofuels are also one of the alternatives used for lower emissions. Well, what about China, my final example? China is working towards an energy mix with less coal and more renewables and liquefied natural gas, or LNG. LNG is also playing an increasingly important role in transport, and China has its largest fleet globally of LNG-powered trucks. It has over 200,000 of those trucks. Now, Shell wants to help create a more sustainable energy future. For example, by providing natural gas, by providing LNG, and LNG is important to Asia. And LNG is equally important to Singapore because Singapore, for example, gets 95% of its electricity for, uh, for gas from power stations. And in 2015, it imported more than 1.2 million tons of LNG. Gas is a cleaner burning fuel than coal and actually a perfect partner to renewables. Even after the processing of, and liquefying and transporting and turning it back into gas again, 
LNG produces about 40% less CO2 than coal when burnt for power. Gas is also flexible. It's abundant, and its uses, as I've mentioned already, are quite diverse. And Shell, as a company, is also involved in every stage of that LNG process, from finding the fields, extracting the natural gas, to liquefying it, shipping it, transporting it, and turning the LNG back into gas and gain and distributing it to either industrial customers or retail customers. But actually, there is more we can do to help create a lower carbon future in Asia. And since I'm in charge of Shell's downstream business, let's talk about retail as an example, because Shell has 43,000 retail sites across 70 countries in the world, serving 25 million customers every day. By 2025, we will significantly increase the amount of low emission fuels that we shall offer our customers around the world. These fuels will have lower emissions than our current gasoline and diesel. And by this time as well, we also aim to reduce the carbon intensity of our retail outlets by at least 50%. And we'll do this through low CO2 designed equipment and operations, as well as embedding what I like to call a low carbon mindset throughout our company. Retail stations, ladies and gentlemen, of course, are obviously a relatively small part of the total global challenge that we face in the years to come. But changes in energy use will need to happen in virtually every part of society in which we operate and in which we live. There will be and should be no exceptions. Governments, academia, for which we have many here today, consumers, and companies like my own, Shell, will need to work together to meet this enormous challenge in a highly collaborative way, seeking to find the answers to some of the questions. And this is why Shell Make the Future Festival actually promotes collaboration itself. And with its willingness to collaborate and its track record for forward thinking, what better place to hold this event than Singapore? So let's follow in the footsteps of Singapore in these next few days, and let's collaborate to make the future. So thank you for your attention, and I'm sure you'll have an extremely enjoyable and inspiring day. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, John, for that. Thank you.